Okay, Comedy Road Wednesday. Love Comedy Road Wednesday. Ever? God, is this camera shaking? This week it's uh, Augie Smith. And uh, Augie, for those of you that don't know, is a very funny guy. Been around a long time. And uh, if you get a chance to catch him live, do it. Uh, or Google him, YouTube him. And uh, actually every Monday he's got a... Th- a uh, live feed on Facebook called Push Up. What's it called? Monday Push Up. I'm trying to talk too fast here. Monday Night Push Ups. I watched it uh, this past Monday uh, for the first time, actually. And uh, he did 100 push ups, which is pretty impressive. I cannot do 100 push ups. I will admit that right now. I don't think that makes me less of a man than Augie. Um, but it makes me feel like I am less of a man. But but I know psychologically, internally, it doesn't make me less of a man. It just makes me feel like less of a man. All um, right. We won. We won. We beat technology. Yeah, can you turn it sideways? Is it possible to turn it sideways? Absolutely. There you go. Widescreen. Outstanding. Hold on. Let me get it perfect. Well, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. Oh, man. Now my, I got glare. I need a makeup artist, man. I need, I need a goddamn makeup artist. I've got glare on my forehead here. Somebody needs to come over with a sponge with a little bit of makeup. I, I don't know how these guys do it. These guys all set up this, uh, this podcast stuff in the garage or whatever. Right. They always look perfect. Their lighting is always perfect. I got myself one of these lights for nighttime, uh, a big ring light. And uh, I do all my stuff just in the backyard because we have a garage, uh, but it's just, you know, dark and filled with stuff and everything. And the acoustics aren't great. And uh, then we have, I, I'm telling you, life. Uh, I got five people in a house that I have had bigger hotel rooms. It is the smallest house in California. And so I just bring everything in my backyard. And normally at night, you get a beautiful view of my swing sets. Uh, but we oh, have to man. fix that because I... it's, too, it's too sunny back there. It's too yeah. beautiful. You can't see it, Leif, because it's too beautiful. Well, I, I, you know, now I can't even go on with this, with this vlog. Uh, just thinking of that swing set that I can't see. And it actually becomes a piece of art in my mind. Oh, yeah. It's something. It, because what it is, um, swing sets, uh, you can change the swing, meaning that there's a toddler swing, and that's the one where you put your feet out, and then you're completely encircled, right? Right. And then right. there's the swing swing, right? Right. And so we change from the toddler swing to the swing swing and back to the toddler swing when we had another baby. So we got seven, five, and uh, 16 months at this point. Yeah. Well, first of all, that's how you beat technology, by learning how to do shit like that. Second of all, second of all, that's something I I wanted to talk to you. I was actually thinking, I try and I don't prepare. I'm late. I'm too lazy. That's why I'm a comedian. I don't prepare for these talks. Sure. But one of the things that occurred to me to talk about was the fact that you have kids and you started kind of at a later age like i did so we have that in common uh which you know a lot of people have kids in their 20s and we were in our what late 30s i was i was 45 wow, fuck when you're my older. son was 44 yeah. 45 when my son was born wow yeah isn't that something i, I was 38 when my daughter was born I yeah and I, and i wasn't ready <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know the funny know. thing is uh, at this age now, and I'll, I'll be uh, 52 this year. Um, at this age, I look back at the person I was in my 20s, and I don't even recognize that guy. I realized right. that it was a human that I was, and he had some similar characteristics to me, but he just seems like a completely different guy. And I couldn't even imagine being married with a kid back then. I, yeah. I couldn't imagine being married to the, the, my girlfriend when I was, you know, 23 or whatever I, I just i couldn't imagine that oh yeah it's a, I ne- it seems I like never, a whole different life i never thought i would get married i mean, that, it was yeah. it was a complete surprise to me when it happened 
I mean, the, the fact that I met somebody that I wanted to, to that I would even think the word marriage. Uh, right. I, I wasn't going to do that. I was just going to be a single guy working the road. Um, now, let me just ask you something tech, technically. Does it look like I'm looking at you? Uh, it looks like you're looking right at me. I oh, feel okay. like I'm looking off to the side because I uh, my phone sideways. So my, my camera is all the way on one side and I'm trying to pick that out. Yeah, it's still, it's still, I'm trying to not, not, now I'm looking at myself on the other side of the screen because of the split screen, but, but I've got the camera set up so that I can see you and, and the, and the camera is just a little bit off center off of you. So I don't know, I'm not looking straight at the camera. I'm looking at you. And so hopefully it looks like I'm looking at you also on the. It looks uh, like you're looking at me, but I feel like uh, to you, it looks like I'm talking to the guy next to you. Yeah, yeah, no, not, yeah, it looked, it not, God, my, my video keeps flickering every now and then, and I don't know what that is, if it's a bad I don't think that's on me. No, I don't my, think it's uh, on you. My pretty strong right here. No, yeah, yeah, mine too, I, I think it's my HDMI connection from my camera to my laptop, it, it usually doesn't do that, but uh, anyway, I can always edit stuff out if I have to, if it goes bad. Okay. Uh, but hey, uh, like I said, I don't prepare for these things, man. But it's, it's good to see you. It was good to see you at Jokers. Uh, for the yeah, for those that don't know, uh, you and I probably met. I don't know, twenty five years ago. It's got to be. It's got to be. I, I believe, Leif. I was trying to think of this. I think uh, we we definitely worked Pat Wilson gigs together, but I wasn't sure if that was the first one. I think Kay Frazier. Do you remember uh, working for Kay Frazier? Oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah. we did one of her gigs together it was the first time we met, I think. And uh, yeah, that would have been, uh, yeah, it would have been 90, 96, maybe something like that. Yeah. And my, my memory tells me that it was for, uh, for um, it was at Calhoun's and Roseburg for Donna Richards. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very possible. Yeah, yeah. I used to. I used to feature that gig probably three times a year. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you featured and you went on the headline and then yeah. uh, you went on to do rants. And I really respect you for that because uh, I've always wanted to, to do rants, but I, I can never get past 15 seconds. You know, I'll start a rant and then it's, it's over. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, a long time ago, I decided that um, a big part of comedy is just describing things. Right. It like just and so it became a, a sort of a writing exercise for me is that I would just close my eyes and then uh, look and focus on something and then describe that, describe every detail of that. Right. Right. Uh, just as, as exact as I could get it, because, uh, man, our job, uh, our job is just uh, it's making a bunch of interesting sentences all together. It's right. just making a group of interesting sentences. And so, yeah, always, always be working on that. I, it was my thing. So then I started writing that way. I remember the first joke I wrote in that style, because uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be uh, I wanted to be Dice Clay when I was 18. Okay. Uh, and then I wanted to be um, uh, Norm Macdonald for a little while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was who I wanted to be when I was young. I want to be Norm now. I'd like to be dead. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, get out of this life. No, but but I'll tell you about Norm. I had uh, I, I I did not respect him the way I do now. Now that he's gone, I, I started getting into okay, what was he all about? Right. And I, I, for some reason, I didn't like the Saturday Night Live uh, uh, the uh, news things, and that was about the only thing I knew about him. And right. and then when I when I see the stuff that he was doing, uh, the online stuff that the Norm show that uh, yeah, you know, I mean yeah, the just, show, the Norm McDonald yeah, thing. Just, the... I, I, I can't get enough. I can't get enough. One of the great talk show guests in history. And and that's saying something. That too, it's that it's too, hard to be funny right. on a talk show. Right. And he was he always, always was just crushed as right. a guest on a talk show. Right. Uh, that, I, that was uh, just going back and rediscovering that after he passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, yeah, and he the, was having, and that that rhythm, that pacing and that voice, the 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 way he kept made his voice go up a little bit, like everything was a question a little bit. And it's, it's the Canadian style, but man, 
uh, he just de- did it perfectly. So yeah. the point of like uh, nearly everything he said ended up being funny. <laughs> right. And the, pa- yeah. and the pauses that kind of made him look dumb, mm-hmm. but then it wasn't, you know? Yeah. And his yeah. fake excitement of, yeah, yeah. I like when he just comes up right. a little bit like, oh, this, right. yeah, I'm happy about this part. Yeah. 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 So much good stuff. Yeah. It seems, didn't we, it seems like we've lost a lot lately. Right. Yeah. It seems like they, they kind of clumped together with Louis Anderson and uh, Saget and, right. um, uh, Mort Saul was right in there too. Yeah, like in a period of a couple of months, it seemed like. Yeah, more. I mean, Mort Saul might be more of a. You might have expected a little more because he was so much older. <laughs> yeah, I saw. You know, I didn't have the guts. I was just starting to do open mics in L.A., driving a cab, and 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 I went into this restaurant to pick somebody up, and I saw Mort Saul. This is back in the eighties, early eighties. Uh, yeah, early eighties. And I saw Mort Saul sitting in a very uh, um, empty restaurant at a table by himself with a newspaper. And I didn't have the guts to go up and say something. And I, I regret that to this day. Oh, man. Yeah. Because he was, he was like, he was, well, when I was a kid, he was like, he was a guy that made me, pay, one of the guys that made me pay attention to stand up comedy. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, he used to hang out at that gig in uh, Mill Valley, uh, the theater up there, the Throckmorton. Oh, uh, did okay. a night comedy show. Yeah. And um, they had, they, if you came in from out of town, there was a beautiful hotel across the street. They put you up at for like one show. Um, and But in the green room, uh, sometimes would be Dana Carvey or right. uh, Robin Williams or more often Mort Saul. I hung out with Mort Saul. Nice. like four or five times but i was always even in that small confined space i was still so intimidated just by him and his legacy sure. that i had a hard time talking to him and like really i couldn't even like look him in the eye and stuff i it was just like <laughs> yeah so I, I i can't say that i had a relationship with him but yeah it was no, weird to it, hang around with somebody that you admired like that yeah right and i i, I mean i respect you as a comic so it's it's really good to hear somebody that I respect talk about being a little starstruck because I get that way. You know, you get that way with somebody that that's like an icon for you. Like, like uh, I hung out at the L.A. Cabaret. I don't know how familiar you are with, with the, you know, L.A. in the 80s and 90s, but the L.A. Cabaret was one of the main clubs. OK. And Steve, and Steve Allen would come in. <laughs> no kidding. And he was one of my, I mean, I'd walk home from junior high school and he had a syndicated show back then that would come on in LA in the afternoon. So I'd, I'd walk home from junior high school and I'd watch the Steve Allen show and he would have people like Bob Einstein on there doing, doing uh, put on bits, you know, pretending right. to be somebody, you know, somebody else. Steve Martin. Would, they came yeah, on Steve and, Martin went on that show, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And pretended to be a balloon artist. <laughs> It was hilarious. He would, he would talk about, you know, the intricacies and all the struggles he's had be, and not not being taken seriously as a balloon right. sculptor. And people would laugh and he'd look up like he was really hurt. Like, why are people laughing? You know, this is my life. And then and then he goes, you know, I, I, I've been working on this one piece for 10 years now and I, and I brought it here and I was wondering if I could show you and, and your audience. And Steve says, sure. And, and they walk out on the main stage and there, here's this huge uh, mountain of something covered by sheets. And he, he, walked, he, he explains how long it took him to put this balloon art together and how proud of it he is. And he walked, just as he's about to pull the sheet, he trips and he falls and all these balloons are popping and, you know, just typical Steve Martin stuff. Yeah. And, right. That, and that, that was Steve Allen. And I would, I saw him, I walked, I mean, I brushed by him in a very, very empty bar, you know, at 6 p.m. at the L.A. Cabaret. And I, I didn't have the nerve to, I, it was like, oh, I don't want to disturb him. You know, I don't want to be that right. fan. I don't want to be that guy. But, but how I, nice would that be to have a, have a young person in the profession uh, tell you how much they admire you? Yeah. I, I've, never much- been, I've never been mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And how much he meant to me because I was a right. lonely kid, you know, I was a loner yeah. and I'd come home and, and comedy was my, you know, was, was my 
relief from life, you know, or from from whatever, you know. There's, there's always been a generation of that guy, uh, of of that's what they, you feel like the rest of the world doesn't accept you. Uh, but there's this thing, comedy. There's right. this oddball thing uh, that you attach yourself to. Uh, there's always been that that generation of people and they're they're still around. They're still coming to shows. Right. Yeah. And they're right. younger and they're, they're of all ages. It's, yeah. it's pretty wonderful. Yeah, it is. Um, I was talking about uh, seeing celebrities. I was at, um, when my oldest son was first born, I, had, I go to a comics lunch down in, uh, down in, um, um, in Hollywood. And there's like six or seven of us comics. And right as we're about to leave, Jeff Goldblum walks in uh-huh. uh, with I don't know, his wife or his girlfriend or whatever. And they go sit kind of in the back of the restaurant. And there's nobody around them. It's not closed off or anything. They're just not that busy of a place. And I sat down. I thought, I love this man. I love Jeff Goldblum. He's, right. li- he's, he's honestly my favorite actor. It went right. from John Wayne to Jeff Goldblum. That's a, that was my order of my favorite actor. Oh, wow. And so um, I thought if I could get a picture with him and my baby, not even me. I did have him holding my baby. And yeah. I'd have that forever. I right. just... And I couldn't bring myself to go and interrupt him. I couldn't bring myself right. just to cross the space and say, this, uh, this is going to take 10 seconds if he could just hold the baby. And I right. love you. And right. he would have been fine with it. He right. would have been excited about it. Right. He, he would have he wanted to hold. He would have wanted to do it. And I couldn't even ask him to do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I completely relate. I've talked I talk myself out of uh, situations like that because... Uh, and and the you know the irony is the most satisfying compliments i get you know i'm always my own bi- biggest critic so when people if i have a really good show people oh you're great man you're really funny you're really great i'm and, you know i'm going oh, thank you but in the back of my mind i'm like yeah i could have done this better could have done that better whatever yeah. yeah i'm glad you liked it but the the real satisfying one is when somebody sincerely says you know i really needed to laugh and you really me- it really meant something for me to be here tonight because i've had i've had such a hard day or such a hard week or or my life has just really been really been bad and you and and laughing really helped me tonight you know yeah and then you know that's not a bother people aren't bothering me by telling me that you know yeah i'll tell you like there's been a couple times where people have said stuff that i'll just absolutely never forget and one right. of them was a show, actually, uh, it was in Boise and it was a few years ago. And uh, there was two older gentlemen. And at this age, when I say older, they, you know, so they were 60 plus is what they were. You're talking about me. You're talking about me. And I'm talking yeah. about you, but yeah. older, older than you. You would have called them older gentlemen. Yeah. They, they were up there. You know how many times I've called people older gentlemen only to find out they're two years younger than me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see myself the same way others do. Then you got to tell them that you're older than that. Just to yeah. not <laughs> But he anyway, came up and yeah. he said he was there with his, with his, you know, friend, his lifelong friend, whoever. And he told me, he said, uh, my wife died about nine months ago and I haven't been out of the house. This is my first time out of the house since that. Like, you know, his friend wow. dragged him. Right. And how he, for a little while, he just got lost in the world. I forget his exact words, but it was something like, you know, you took me away from that pain uh, uh, yeah, for a while. Yeah. And yeah. Like, well, okay. I'll never get past that. That's, right. Yeah. Right. I've, I've, in all the years I've been doing comedy, I've only had a few, you know, that's similar, not exactly, but yeah. And, and I, I remember, I remember every one of them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, no, not not just it happening, but the town you were in too. You know? Right, right. So many stories do you have? It's like, where was that? And then like three guys argue about which city it was. Right. <laughs> Nobody knows. But but those meaningful ones, that's when you go, oh, you know, because people do that throwaway thing. Laughter is the best medicine, and blah blah blah. And we're really providing a service by making people laugh. You know, this it's kind of like, but. It, it really, you know, when you hear something like that, you go, oh, yeah, we, it, it really can't be a service. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you another one, uh, Leif, and this, this is, I think, one of my, just my favorite comedy stories. Um, there was uh, an open mic in Portland uh, on Tuesday nights at a bar called Suki's. 
And mm. Suki's was literally the basement of a travel lodge mm. in uh, the outskirts of downtown Portland, like downtown ends. And then there's this place. Um, and it would start at like, you know, 830 ish and basically go till the bar clubs. Like we just go all night and end with like an hours long improv game. And it was, you know, there was a small group of people that were into it. Uh, and there was a woman that did not look like she belonged there. Uh, there was an older woman uh, called Shelly. And uh, Shelly would just sit at her own little table uh, and watch all the acts. And I mean, imagine, imagine what's going on here. We had first time rowdy comics going up at midnight telling the worst, most horrible jokes you could possibly imagine. And there's just this sweet woman taking it all in, always being supportive. Uh, I would start to talk to her after the shows every once in a while and really just started to enjoy her as a person. And then I was going to move from Portland and I sat down and had the longest conversation with her I'd ever had. And what she told me was that before she started coming to Suki's, uh, she was inbound. She was agoraphobic. She didn't leave mm -hmm. the house. And she had a neighbor, uh, Veronica Heath, uh, who was a comic uh, that she would see. And she finally talked her into coming to the show one night. And then she just embraced this community. And I mean, there are comics that called her mom that still call her mom. There's several comics that call her that. Right. And she passed away a couple of years ago. But I just I, I'll never forget that, that. Literally, this show was the thing that got her back out into the world. That right. was her connection with comedy. No matter right. how important it is to us, there are members of the audience. It's just that important or even more so. And right. Um, yeah, right. that's the, that's one of the beautiful things about this job and entertainment in general on this gig. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I see uh, the importance of it. And I always... When I talk about the importance of stand up, I always that sound like I'm satirically overstating it, uh, but it's just because it's what I really believe. I believe that we live in a society that get, is getting further and further apart. We're isolating ourselves more than we ever have. We do less things as a group in general. Uh, we still do things as a group, but we do less of them in general. And this thing of stand up comedy, of people gathering just to hear their fellow man speak. Not a two hundred million dollar movie, uh, not you know some band, uh, not the Rolling Stones. Just a guy you might not even know who the guy is, and he is going to tell stories for a little while, and you're going to sit down quietly and you're going to take that in. When society can no longer do that, when we can no longer gather for that, that's the end of it all. That's the end of polite society. That's when we've completely fractured. When we right. can't just take that in as an entertainment anymore and that's i believe the importance of stand-up comedy i believe i honestly i believe it's like the last line of defense uh for civil society and i that's the way that we have to approach it because that's what it is and i'm telling you man in the time uh i think we've been doing it about the same amount of time uh, i i started basically it's been my job since 92 and i started in 90 and yeah, uh yeah I, I honestly, I think it's just gotten better and better and better. Each year of it, the, the comedy as a whole and uh, the product that's being put out uh, by the comics of the day, I just think it improves all the time. I really do. And of course, I love, I love the old guys. And I mean, the, the reason I'm into it is because the people that I started watching, you know, when I was 14 uh, were hilarious and continue to be hilarious. Right. That's why. I, yeah. Right. Yeah, but the, the style has changed. Uh, the the uh, yeah, the deliveries changed. The conversations changed. Yeah, but it's still. Uh, if it makes you laugh, it makes you laugh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I'll tell you, man, these kids—they go deep. They share everything now. Right. <laughs> There's, I it, I mean, it used to be like a guy would come out. He's like. I'm Italian and then do Italian jokes and right. not laugh. But now, I mean, it's like I'm a biracial and I was raised in a circus. And, you know, my my father was killed in prison. All this, these incredibly personal things. Uh, there's this guy, Moses Stornow, who was raised in a cult. He was raised in a cult. 
And now he does jokes talking about that. They get so uh, personal about their lives. I just really right. dig it because there was right. always some part of that, but it was usually like with a wink, like this isn't real. You know, it's right. like even when uh, when Joan Rivers would talk about her husband, uh, it, it was always blown up and it, it not, there was nothing really that personal about it. But you now, know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's, a, if it's a really well written joke and it's funny and, and it catches you by surprise, you know, even if it's made up, it, you know, it'll make you laugh. But I really admire um i really admire the honesty that's that's coming out and it, it it's inspiring me to open up more because i wasn't brought up that way for for one thing i was i was i'm swedish i was brought up you know in a very repressed kind of you don't talk about yourself you don't talk about your family uh, uh society and and culture um but just just watching the younger comedians, it's like, well, fuck it. You know, I, yeah. can, I can do it too. I, I can open up. It helps me open up more. Yeah. It's and the it's, most it, original yeah. thing I can do is talk about my own emotions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And own experiences. And every now and then you see somebody and it's like, you know, why, why are you doing that? You're just making shit up, you know, to yeah. try to, you know, you're just yeah, making that, shit that up. That didn't happen. That's not yeah. real. Yeah. 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 You know, and I'm not going to be that that heckler that's going to be, oh, that never happened. But it's like, but it, but it's not as enjoyable as something that actually happened or something that that really touched that person. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And even if uh, even if you're sharing a life that the person uh, does not share, uh, making right. it relatable. What, right. what a beautiful thing that is. When two right. people that have nothing in common, uh, one can make the other laugh. I, right. I just that's another beautiful part of that about this job. Yeah, it's funny you say, uh, you know, you were you were taught to be kind of repressed and a repressed. And there's so many men that are that way. But with right. me, <laughs> I was raised my uh, raised by my mother and she was a social worker who very much believed in therapy and talking yeah. about. Yeah, no, that's yeah, so good I, for you. it was like the opposite with me. It was like right. share every emotion and feeling right. all right. the time. <laughs> right. Good for I'll you. you. Well, that, has its, that has its pitfalls also. I, I will say that. <laughs> yeah, saying too much. <laughs> it's just uh man, sometimes yeah, you do. It's it sounds old, but sometimes you just gotta suck it up. Sometimes right. you just gotta understand yeah. that something isn't fair and keep moving and right. not make a big damn deal about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's most of life. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, shit. I, I said something on Facebook the other day that uh, about three or four people got really offended, really offended. And it has to do with this trans transgender, uh, you know, like high level athletics. Mm -hmm. And and it was a meme where a motorcyclist is passing a bunch of bicyclists. And, you know, the, ba the basis of the, of the meme was, that, you know, this really, you know, this isn't fair. You know, it's like I relate as a I'm I, I'm a I ride a motorcycle, but I relate as a cyclist. Yeah, as a bicyclist, right? As a bicyclist, and I just broke the world's record. You know, I'm the champion. And uh, it was, to me, it's just a funny meme. But I guess I shared it public. I didn't share it just friend, just friends. And I got three or four people that you know that's transphobic, that's hate, that's this. You know, it's well, and and this is the other side of the share and everything on stage is that people think that every joke represents you as a human being. Like, I can't, like, right. if I do a, a, a joke about uh, Trump, well, then I hate him. Or if right, I do right, a joke right. about Biden, well, then I love Trump and I hate Biden. Right. It can't just be a joke about the president of the United States. It's got to inform the world of your heart and soul and history. And people read so much into these damn things. And it's just like, and, and here's the other thing that we're going to lose if people continue to get upset about every goddamn joke is that sometimes in my act, I'm the villain. Sometimes right. I'm saying the wrong thing. I'm right. doing the wrong thing. Right. That part, sometimes I'm wrong. That's the, idea, that's the idea of the joke. And you, you can't allow me not to be wrong. I, I need to be able to be wrong. You right, can't right. take that away. Right. And, and it's, and it's, you know, I'm, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that can be part of the joke. And, it, and, and there's a little bit of sophistication in there. And, it, and if you're not really there, 
to have a sense of humor and to just relax and laugh, yeah. you're going to start picking that apart. Uh, you know, and, pe and people, uh, you know, people get tribal. Like you said, it has to be, it has to be very rigidly this way. And if you don't speak this way very rigidly, well, then you're on the way opposite extreme and I hate you. Yeah. 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 Because uh, uh, it's also that uh, in life, and this isn't just in comedy now, but then it, it bleeds into comedy. Um, we are classifying somebody as the worst thing they've ever done. Uh, like, right. here's the deal right, is right. that I know a lot of people that have made a lot of bad mistakes in their life. I know, I know criminals and I know recovering addicts. I know right. active addicts. <laughs> I know people right. that steal and do all kinds of stuff. And that's the thing. But here's the deal. That isn't all they are. That isn't right. the totality of the person. And that, and it's, I, I feel like, um, we're, we're raising people with this idea that this thing uh, removes them uh, from society. This one thing they did or whatever. Yeah, this one and, thing they did or said 20 years ago is yeah. that that's them. Yeah. That's them yeah. today. Yeah. Right. Because how could yeah. they have grown as a human being? Right. And, 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 <laughs> and how could they be perfect? They're obviously not perfect like me. Right. Who's, ne who's never right. made a mistake, never said How anything. How they have ever me. thought something at a time, it, yeah, that I don't think, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, uh, yeah. And I think that most people don't actually feel that way, but I think that uh, social media amplifies it to the point yeah, really that we right. think more people feel that way than they actually feel. Right. And then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, because then you think, uh, my favorite is, well, they're doing it, so now I do it. Other right. people are being upset about a joke. So now I have to get upset about a joke. Right. Uh, even things out somehow. I shouldn't right. rise above that. I should lower myself to the shittiest part of our nature. Right. Instead of elevating yourself above it. Ah, man, that 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 one, that is the one that gets to me more than anything. And it comes it comes full circle back to what you were talking about, the end of civilized society, when we get into those two camps and you can't say right. or do anything that that's going to upset the other camp. And, yeah. and they're so, they're so far apart that it's impossible not to say anything or do something that's going to upset one of the camps. Yeah. And everything has just become a blood sport now. I just, right. Right. It, 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 if, it's, if somebody's in the news and you don't like them, they're not just wrong. Everybody's a pedophile now. Everybody. Right. 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 And they, like right. whoa, or, what? What? Or, they were going to that? That's your that's your thing now. That's yeah. your attack. Right. I, it's just like they can't just be bad. They have to be the worst thing you can be. Right. <laughs> and yeah, and it comes back to social media, and it's 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 like that old thing about you know people have the balls to flip somebody off if they're sitting in their car, you know, with the windows rolled up, huh. but they would never do it to the guy's face. You know, but, you know, you're you're sitting there on Facebook, you know, you can go ahead and say whatever you want, because, uh, you know, it's basically you're big. Even if your name's up there, it's basically anonymous. And what are they going to do? Travel 3000 miles to hunt you down? You know, right. yeah. so you say terrible things, you say terrible, the worst things terrible you'd thing. never say to a woman person, not right. just because you're afraid of getting punched in the nose, but just because there's something inside you that tells you not to do that, to, that keeps you away from the conflict with your fellow man. But right. somehow there's something on social media that draws you to that conflict. Right. Where in real life, we're re it, you know, we repel. Man, that one. <laughs> then and that's it, where it our, our worst nature. That's where our worst nature ends up coming out. Yeah. I, and I'll tell you, man, I, you know, I used to mix it up. I used to mix it up with people all the time. Right. And it would just the negative energy that came back was right. just so overwhelming. Right. That, uh, I mean, I still do, like in my act, I, I will do jokes, but I, I don't think people leave knowing what I think about anything. I, I mean, I went the last part of Trump's administration without even bringing up his name, because just because the oh, mere yeah. mention of his name oh, was yeah. just this anger that was just rising. Yeah, ah! yeah. And his supporters would just start yelling out, Trump! <laughs> right, right. And then the, the room would be polarized. <laughs> 
it just became it didn't matter how good the joke was or what the right. joke was about or what yep. it meant. It just it wasn't even worth it. So right. I just I just stopped talking about it. Yeah, I did. Was, too. I, I mean, yeah. I'm, I, I yeah, I stopped doing I started doing political humor when I first started. But mm -hmm. it, it, it just it got just too, people are just too divisive, too divided, you know, too. I mean, I look, it's like we made millions of Clinton jokes, millions of them. Right, right. Uh, we made Bush jokes. I made Obama jokes. Uh, you saw less of those, I guess. And then by the right. time we got to Trump, it's like you couldn't you can't even do it. And now no. the thing is, we have this old doddering man in charge of the country who's an obvious cognitive decline. And I feel like I can't make jokes about it. Hey, fuck you. Biden is doing a fucking great job. <laughs> great? You're, a I You're a fucking pedophile. <laughs> Don't bring exactly. that shit here. Don't exactly. bring that shit on my YouTube channel. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, and so it, and so I end up uh, censoring myself on social media. I, it, I like starting like a year ago or something. I just couldn't take it anymore. And so now right. it's just dumb jokes and kid pictures and I, an occasional satirical joke that will still send me replies that I just. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. I, I've gone through the exact same thing and I, and I started just doing, you know, just silly fun things or just, you know, responding to other people's you know, fun memes, you know, but, uh, but yeah. And then I put this one meme up that I thought was pretty funny and pretty self-explanatory if you follow the news, because we had sure. this champion, this swimmer that was like ranked 148th as a man and then smashing records swimming in, with against females with female bodies female mm -hmm. inside yes but a male body male chromosomes and suddenly she's number one and so it was that, that's what the meme was all about and it was all it wasn't everybody it was three or four people that were just like you're a you're a transphobe you're you know hateful person blah 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 and all this shit and then other people mix it in and then you get all these side issues coming in and then my ex-wife described it as yeah it's a dumpster fire just ignore it you know, because it, it just yeah. Totally... You're not. It, there's no explaning yourself. There's no like. It, it right, doesn't right, kind right. Of, which kind I of... which I did. I went through it. They they're like, well, what's your point then? You know, and I I explained it. It's you know, it's a different no body. No point. What's, there's what... no point. It's just a yeah. joke. It's a joke, and you know, it's pretty about self-explanatory. About something that's happening. Yeah. About something that's happening. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you know? Uh, did you ever meet in Seattle, Barbara Sear? Did you know, ever know Barbara Sear? Uh, Barbara Sear was the first trans? Woman, yeah, first trans woman I ever knew. And yeah. she went to like Sweden in like 80 and did the surgery, like where you had to cross. No, she used to, to come to shows, a, right? In Seattle? Yeah. And yeah, then yeah, she, was, yeah. she was a comic in Seattle for a while. And I, I mean, I was just always fascinated uh, to talk to her. I just thought that like just that decision in life, man, you know? And so when she'd go on stage and she'd start to speak about it, it was like, I will never hear these kinds of jokes from anybody else. There's nobody right. else. that. Does. And now we're in an era uh, where I know quite a few trans comics at this point. And uh, to hear their take on their lives and what they're doing, I think is it's just, it's absolutely uh, fascinating. It's just a, it's a new part of stand up that I really enjoy. And I remember that uh, it was only a couple of years ago when accepted terminology for trans people uh, has now become uh, almost a curse word. It's become a pejorative that right. we didn't really think about, you right. know? Right. And I just think uh, it's like, how, how does comedy deal with uh, historically marginalized people uh, and include them in jokes, uh, but not just at their shit on expense. Them. Not their yeah. at their expense. Yeah. Right. Why can't why can't they be like everybody else? Right. You know why if why I don't censor myself when I talk about anybody else, but now I now I do, and so that's honestly something in comedy that I'm still struggling with. I I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to how to find that median between. Uh, everybody uh, can be, you know, a target, so to speak, and humor can be found anywhere. Uh, 
in be to just shitting on somebody, shitting on a you know a marginalized group. I, I mean, think about think about the homophobia in stand up throughout the years. Right. It right. was just it was a known joke to like, oh, don't think that I'm gay or that guy's gay. Right, was, right, right. <laughs> that guy's gay. That was just that was an insult. You're gay. Right, right. <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. Still, and it to some people. real quick that we moved away from it. I mean, it happened. It seems like in six months where we decided, oh, that isn't that isn't optimal to do. Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, it's been it's been interesting to watch and to be a part of. Yeah. And I know that uh, I myself have decided that there's just certain words, and I never thought I'd say this, life, but there's just certain words that I'm not going to use because when I started in comedy. And when I started to get good at it, here was my mindset. My mindset was, A, I'm a comedian above all other things. I was a comedian, and then everything else was a distant third. Uh, that's what I was. And so words didn't have meaning until I gave them meaning. That words were just this clay that I would mold into something beautiful and present to people. And so nothing was off limit. And so I watched my God, Carlin, use the N word in a joke. So to be God, all you have to do is as God does. So I'm going to do that. And so uh, I didn't do it a lot. But in pursuit of a joke, I said the N word on stage up until about 2004, something like that. I wouldn't do it again. I don't regret doing it, but I wouldn't do it again because as I've grown older, I've just thought, why? You know, why? What am I going to say that's so interesting that I can spew that toxic fumes into a crowd? You know, because that's what it is. It's a word that just makes people feel icky and it brings up uh, a bad past uh, for a lot of your audience. Uh, and then, yeah, it's just. It's like it's not worth it. I'm not saying I shouldn't be allowed to because anybody should be allowed to say whatever and make it interesting. I'm saying personally, I wouldn't right. anymore. But right. there was a time where I thought I'm so good. It doesn't matter that my poetry rises above all things and they right. will accept. That. Yeah. How did, how did that work out <laughs> what, when you did it? Uh Normally, okay, I would pick and choose. It was one specific bit, uh, and it was in... Um, I'm, was I'm in, not asking you to do my, it right now. It was in my CD pitch, <laughs> believe it or not. So, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. But but you never, you never got any real hostility? No, no. I mean, over the years, the things that people have gotten upset about have been incredibly surprising to me. I'm going to say this, and I don't know if this rings true for you too. The most sensitive group of people I've ever encountered in 30 years in stand-up comedy are bike riders, people that ride bicycles. And this bicycles. might have to do with I, I bikers. <laughs> yeah, like motorcycles. I think this might be part of it, like because I I had developed some satirical jokes about how bicycles were stupid. How there had okay. been a technology war and you lost it, man. Right. Okay, you're hanging on to the past, and it, it was some really solid punchlines throughout it. It was a funny bet, but I'm telling you, when I did it on radio or uh, like on like a local TV show or whatever, right? Uh, email box just flooded with wow. angry people. Wow. I, I've never seen anything like it. All the horrible stuff I've said on stage over the years. Nothing right. has even come close to the anger of bicyclists after wow. my show. Yeah, I should I should write some bicyclist jokes. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even think about that when you were telling me about your meme. It's them, right. it's them damn bikers, man. They just they take it very seriously. Wow, <laughs> they take their lifestyle very seriously. Wow, I I had no idea. I, I I've gotten I've gotten blowback. I I was I did uh, long before gay marriage became legal anywhere uh and was just talked about i mean i got i got a little bit every now and then blow back in some 
let's say, right wing areas of the country, talking about, you know, d defending defending gay marriage or, or or just saying what's the big deal, right? And that's about as bad as it got. Um, yeah, but I I can't imagine that. I never would have thought bicyclists would be the uh, the toughest crowd. Isn't that funny that we've lived so long that uh, gay marriage was unimaginable when I was young. It yeah. was absolutely unimaginable. Right. Uh, and then when it started to kind of become a thing, uh, our hippie liberal president, Bill Clinton, had his Defensive Marriage Act. Right. And there was this huge uh, storm of people against it. And now it's just a thing that's in the right. world and nobody seems to care about. Just like weed. Just like le legalization yeah. of weed. Yeah. I yeah, I thought much. back in the I thought back in the seventies that that okay it's going to happen soon, and then it just never happened. Then all of a sudden, boom! It seemed like overnight. Yeah, yeah, it did um, seem that way. Yeah, yeah, it's like a couple laws get passed, they see nothing bad happens, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Right. It it turns out if two dudes get married, that has nothing to do with my marriage. That that doesn't that doesn't take away from it at all. Isn't that yeah. weird? Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole point. It's going to ruin my marriage. Really? How's that going to happen? Yeah. yeah. I think, I think I'm, you know what? Adultery is probably going to ruin my marriage. You know? <laughs> They're just looking for something to blame it on, right? right. That's all it was. It was right. just a bunch of people in bad marriages that needed to blame it on something. <laughs> so it's got to be their fault. It's got to be the gays. They're always up to something. The institution. We have to protect the institution. We got to protect the institution. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I always thought, I mean, you know, I've, these are all just, these have all been worked out by now, but I, I always thought like, you know, the government shouldn't be involved in marriage at all, period. You know, if, if you, you know, church, if, if it's a religious ceremony, then, then your church can decide who gets married. And if you want gay church has, can decide that gay people get married, great. You know, yeah. if another church decides it's a man or a woman, okay, fine. That's their church. You don't have to belong to that church, you know? But the, what the government? The government should tell us who can get married and who can't. I don't know. It's a weird one. It's a. Yeah. It's a that's. A, I spent so much of my life um, sort of dissecting the stuff that the government does and maybe what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And right. uh, it's a tough one to nail down anymore, though. I'll, I'll tell you. I I used to. <laughs> I. I used to uh, say that I was a small government guy, and I think I believe that in my heart. Right. But as I get older. I, most of my life is spent. Why doesn't somebody do something about that? And why yeah, doesn't yeah. clean that up? Well, that's I mean, all. Yeah. Oh, that's the whole thing with it. The, there's no more homeless people on my street. Yeah. The, the extremists, yeah. you know, that, that's why, you know, I, I don't like extremists on the left or the right, you know, because yeah. uh, yeah, government can do some things, but they shouldn't be involved in everything, you know. Right. And, but, but some people. And it, what know. we got going is a pretty good thing. Like the, uh, the American system. It all kind of balances out. I mean, the justice system is far from perfect, but it's it's OK. It works out most of the time, you know, kind right. of thing. It's, and, a uh, it's the best the we can IRS do. Is perfect, but they get it. They do OK. You know, the roads, yeah. most of them are nice. They're, right. they're good enough, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And if I know, dial 911, somebody still shows up. Thank God. Right. Yeah. So, things Things could be worse. Yeah. Yeah, it could be worse. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, you. The thing is, man, uh, when you got young kids, you have to be optimistic. You just have to be. I can't have the dark view of the future that I had throughout my my young life. You know, right. my young life was I like like all people or most young people. It's just like, ah, oh, we're destroying the planet and uh, our currency can't possibly survive this deficit and having this level of debt up against our gross national product and everything's going to blow up and a media is going to hit us anyway. And uh, that's the way, you know, you kind of live your life when you're young. Uh, but then you have kids and it's like, ah, oh, everything has to last at least for another 80 years. Right. Right. Then my kid will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they can so take it, it over. It changes. You have to be optimistic now. You have yeah. to believe that people's nature is basically good. You have to believe that. Otherwise, and we're all and I, and I and I think it is, you know, and and and, and uh, getting back to the Facebook thing, you know, I don't 
I've, I've learned not to take it seriously. You know, when I get attacked, you know, shit like that. And one guy, one of the last thing I, I had already given up on this, on this whole thread, but um, one guy added, uh, every time I say something terrible about Leif Skiving, I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my last response in that whole thread was, I just said, LOL, I love you. I still love you. Yes. You, know? I, you can only counter with love, Leif. Yeah, yeah. That's all we got left. All we got left is love. All yeah. we can do is make ourselves the best version of, of ourselves, right? And then that... Right is the way we change the world is yeah. by being the best version of ourselves damn it that's and right. that's what that's what comedy needs to be putting out there right. <laughs> improve yourself assholes yeah <laughs> not we're all gonna die we're all gonna live that's right. the problem we're <laughs> getting be getting back to that yeah yeah nor mcdonald you know he took he's he doesn't have to deal with all this shit no 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 Louis Anderson. I mean, Louis lived probably longer than I thought he would with his uh, with his health. Right. But man, he was killing it up until the end. Him on yeah. baskets. You ever see that? On what? Uh, it's a show called Baskets. It's oh, Zach okay. Galifianakis. No, I did not. Yeah. Get this. Get this. Life. Louis played his mother. He played. Okay. I think Zach I've seen Galifianakis. a clip of that. I think I've seen a clip and, of that. Yeah, uh, and it, it was just it was amazing. It was beautiful. He was perfect. He was this perfect sort of nice uh, uh, Midwestern mother. It was just great. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And then Saget, Saget was killing it. Uh, he did a two hour show the night he died. Two yeah. hours. That old yeah. dude was up yeah. there. Yeah. Getting it to a man, you yeah. know, and uh, I think these guys, I don't think any of them lost the passion, you know, for it, for the thing. Otherwise, I, they couldn't have been doing the thing as well as they were doing it. I yeah, mean, or, or Norm, as long for as example, it, he had to love it to be that good at it. You or, know? As long, or as long. Yeah, or as long. It's, yeah. it's you know, people ask me, it's like, oh, when are you, you know, people that aren't in comedy, well, when are you going to retire? It's like, well, comedians don't retire. <laughs> no. We're just, doing what we love. We're already doing what we, we love. We die. We don't retire. We die. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Or just people stop booking us. <laughs> right, right, yeah, that exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to get it back together now. I mean, I'm still doing gigs. It's it's very slow because, you know, the law of inertia, the thing at rest tends to stay at rest with yeah. a virus kicking in and the whole thing and all that time off. Yeah, there's there's a lot of clubs uh, that I work that, uh, that that didn't reopen, unfortunately, or if they did uh, have become like uh, just a local comic only type place. Right, right. It's too bad. It's too bad. Uh, but, you know, we'll get it back. Right. I mean, people yeah. are going to they're starting to go out again. And I think they'll keep going out more and more and, uh, right down here in L.A. Uh, you can walk around without a mask as of yesterday or the day before. OK, so like, you know, we're just dealing with it now. Yeah. It is what it is. Same here in Washington. Uh, I think it was last week it was the last yeah. mask mask mandate. Hey, thank you, Freedom Truckers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It worked. Way to go, boys. You can come home. Take it to it the worked. streets. Yeah. You won. You yeah. won, boys. You won. Yeah, you can stop honking your horns. Hey, man, I got to go. Uh, I got to go be a dad. You know, OK, uh, I was going to wrap it up with talking about you being a dad, but uh, you just yeah. did it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it real quick. Uh, um, I'll tell you, I told you when I was a young man, uh, I was a comic. And that's what I was. Uh, at this point in my life, I'm still a comic, but it's like the fifth thing I am. I like there's a bunch of other stuff I am before that. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and way up there uh, is dad. And you can't separate your job from being a dad because as a dad, your job is important because you got to got to make that money, baby. Yeah. Uh, but uh, man, it, it has it certainly doesn't have the interest uh, to me uh, as much as the, the fathering part. Um, it's just. It is just wonderful. There's there's one emotion that I'll never be able to describe uh, to people. And it is the emotion of the moment that your child's born. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the room for all three of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the moment that the baby comes out, it's just it's I've never been able to grab uh, to describe what it is. It's like every emotion all at once. 
and it's just just wonderful it's just a wonderful wonderful thing and then all of parenting is some version of that you know all of it is either the the incredible lows or the incredible highs of that uh i just i love it and and i'm glad that that's what i am now you know i'm still good at being a comic but uh, i want to be better being a dad well good for you you know my 25 year old son who's my youngest just just left an hour ago he he came up to visit from idaho and again, yeah. Yeah. And and I think back because I, I was on the road to support my family when they were little. So I was on the road a lot. So yeah. and I was also in the room both time both my kids were born. And I remember when my first one was born, when they put her the mother was under her mother was under sedation because it was a cesarean and I was in the operating. So they cleaned her off and handed her to me. And I, I used to say this on stage, and I meant it sincerely. My first thought was, I can die now. It's like, I have done my job. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's, I've I've, made I've, life! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think back on the times when I was gone on the road. And, and, and then I was also home for a week or two at a time without, without having to go to work every day. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird transition to, as, as far as being a father and i was just wondering how you were dealing with that how much road work are you doing and then we can wrap it up i know you got to go yeah um so we had our last uh, child during pandemic uh which so obviously like everybody i didn't work for a year and a half and then last year i only worked like a weekend a month uh, right. But the la- this year, it's been, it's been at least two and usually three weekends a month. And uh, man, you know, you, you, you forget how difficult it is to leave. It's very, right. I mean, like when I'm home, uh, I take my kids to school. I pick them up from school. I hang out with them after school. You know, we go to the park or we go to a playground right. or wherever we go. Um, and that that all is wonderful. And then you got to leave for a stretch of four or five days. Yeah. And you can see what it does to the kids. I right. see uh, how much it, it tears my son up when I got to go for a long trip. But, yeah. I, but I see how courageous he is because he understands that I have to do it. Uh, but then you think to yourself, well, do I have to? You know, do I have to? Right. Could I figure out another way right. uh, to make a living where I'm also here all the time? I don't know. I don't know, man. It's it's I you know uh, he's seven so it's been seven years I've been dealing with this on one level or another and I haven't figured it out. Um, I'll tell you with FaceTime, sometimes I think it makes it worse. I think oh. ha- seeing them almost makes it worse, like because yeah, knowing right, that you can't right, with them right. and physically touch their heads, you right, know, right, and, man, yeah. So that yeah, it's without a doubt difficult. But guess what? Every dad throughout history has dealt with this. I mean, right. how many dads travel for the job or work 10 hour days yeah. and, you know, only get to see the kids for an hour or so at night. Yeah. Most days, like the weekends when I'm not working, we spend the whole day again. Right. You know, it's, it's great. Right. Yeah. So if it's, if it's any consolation, I'll tell you, my son told me, uh, and he had, he had a great mother. We're divorced. We're still great friends. And luckily, he had a great, very supportive mother. And he told me that, uh, and I know that it hurt him when he would say, hey, dad, we're doing this next week. And said, oh, I'm going to be on the road next week. You know, and I could, I could see the disappointment when he, you know, when he was little. And, uh, and, they, and they, I mean, they got used to it, but, but I could see the disappointment and I could feel it. Um, but now he's 25. And he, he told me the other day that uh, when he gets together with his friends, they're the same age and they start talking about their childhoods and their parents and the problems they had and the unhappy childhoods and, and stuff like that. He goes, I, I can't relate. I can't relate to that. You know, I, 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 I feel like I had a good childhood. So, wow. yeah. you know, maybe he just forgot the times he's, you know, chose to forgot the times he was disappointed, you know, that I wasn't there. But yeah. on the other, other, on the yeah. other hand, I, I would go to school assemblies. Well, if I was home for two weeks, I go to school assemblies and I'd be the only dad there. There'd be all sure. moms, you know? So, yeah. I mean, there's a trade off. Yeah. When, uh, yeah. In the morning dropping off the kids, uh, it's usually my wife, our elementary school is only three houses down from us. It's just okay. such a great. 
right uh, talk with uh, the two older kids and you know pushing the baby carriage and everything uh it's it's a beautiful scene life it's just yeah. a beautiful a beautiful uh, and i'll tell you during pandemic uh being able just to be home with the kids every day at the time you think that it kind of sucks but i think we're all gonna right. look back at a wonderful time right in our was that right. just every day we found a way uh to make each other uh you know a- entertained and happy and the places we go you know where we went we went to the cemetery because it was the only thing open and la has beautiful cemeteries. never closes never closes yes yeah, ne- they never close and so we drive out to the cemetery and we just walk around <laughs> and look cool. at celebrity graves yeah oh yeah yeah so you know i, I, I don't know and the kids called it statues because there's you know there's statues all over right the, the right cemetery. Uh, so they call it going to the statues. So I, w- I wonder if they'll remember that. I don't know. I know I you know, will. Yeah, take, I don't know. I, I have tons of videos. I just converted them to digital and my kids are just loving it. You know, oh, that's look. the thing with the camera phone. Yeah. I, I have thousands, literally thousands of pictures of my kids. I'm yeah. never without them. There are three photos of me as a child. There are right, three right, photos. Right, right. Right. My kids are going to have thousands of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let let's end on the cemetery note. I think that's absolutely uh, as perfect. we will eventually. Exactly. <laughs> hey, man, I love you. At you, you know, you're one of my fa- favorite guys, man. Even even though uh, we don't get to see each other that often, so it was really good to talk to you. It was yeah. it was really nice to see you over New Year's. Same here. Same here. All right. Hope to see you again soon. All right. See you out there. Take care.